Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at the third video in the Reasons for Hope series titled What About Bones? Perhaps in this video they'll finally actually get to discussing some bones. Only an apologist could start off a series on fossils with two entire videos just trying to prime their audience to disbelieve the accepted science. Video one was mostly him trying to convince you that he's going to give the evolutionist side a fair hearing without trying to spin their arguments and whatnot, and video two I already responded to and was mostly him trying to get you to accept his explanation of what the word truth means. Also, my last video on them got flagged by YouTube's content ID system. They did release their claim faster than anyone else I've ever had to deal with when I appealed it, but if I cut it in more often than normal, that's why. Also, the video being shrunk and inset over my background seems to be happening a lot lately, that's also why. Easier to never have it flagged than to have to explain fair use to the people I'm responding to. Anyway, let's jump into this video that hopefully actually goes into some of his evidence. Hey everyone, it's pop quiz time. What is a definition for truth? Really? Again? Okay. My favorite definition is that the truth value of a statement is measured by how well that statement corresponds to reality as adjudicated by predictive power. Do you remember? Truth is that which has fidelity to an original or to a standard. Yeah, but in order to get there you had to go to definition 3C, which is the tertiary definition of the tertiary definition of truth. Mine is a combination of definition 1A1 and 2A, so the primary definition of the primary definition along with the primary definition of the secondary definition. And actually, that's not really fair of me. Your definition is actually the tertiary definition of the secondary definition. You just mislabeled it in your video. It's 2C. You also chose the definition that has the most wiggle room to get around statements being actually true. If I write the earth is flat and then have a bunch of people copy that out, if they do a good job copying, by your definition that makes the statement true because they match up well with my original statement. But the fidelity of their statements to my original has no bearing on the actual shape of the earth. There is no original earth to compare our earth to. So you are choosing a definition that allows non-true statements to be technically called true whereas my definition has an objective measuring stick, so I like mine better. Please hang on to that and choose the right original or standard as the foundation for your life. Well, if there are multiple originals or standards for you to choose from, then the implication there is that means there are multiple truths. I didn't peg you for a pluralist. If you use the above approach with a person who doesn't believe in God, you're very likely to hear comments like, well, science is my foundation, or science proves that there is a God, so let's deal with it. Keep in mind here that science is a methodology, a process, a process in which you make a prediction about how something will pan out, you do an experiment to test this prediction, observe the results of the experiment, draw conclusions based on those results, and then have thousands of other scientists nitpick your work to find as many flaws as they can with your methodology. It is a process that is done by people, which we both agree are fallible. Therefore, it is not a perfect process, it's just the best process that we have for determining what is real and how reality works. And science doesn't say anything about a god, for or against. God is an unfalsifiable proposition, meaning that there is no experiment that can be done which will provide evidence against a god, and it is debatable whether or not any experiment could provide evidence for god. As such, the god proposition is scientifically useless. Most scientists who are religious accept this fact and so don't try to use science to support their beliefs. Rather, they tend to view science as a study of God's handiwork, finding out what natural mechanisms they believe God put in place. And really, when you think about it, that approach makes way more sense than the creationist approach. Rather than having to make excuses as to why the vast majority of scientific knowledge goes against your interpretation of your religion, they instead choose to look at this body of knowledge and feel awe at the mechanisms that they believe God put in place. Awe. I said awe. A-W-E. That's better. In order to do that, we have to define science. According to a Merriam-Webster medical dictionary, science is 
knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method. Yes, I'd agree with that. And as I just pointed out, God does not fall into that category, whether you are arguing in favor of or against God. The existence of God is just not a scientific proposition. You can't apply the scientific method to that particular question. That's easy enough. Science is knowledge. No, you forgot everything after the first word of the definition. The or at the beginning of the definition only applies to the comparison of knowledge as opposed to the system of knowledge. It doesn't eliminate the rest of the definition. Those two things are separate, but they are related. So if we take out the second part of the or statement, as you seem to want to, it is still knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through scientific method. It is not just knowledge itself. It is knowledge about truths or laws that have preferably been put to the test by the scientific method, which I outlined earlier. You can't just ignore 96% of the definition to make your point. Well, I mean, you can, it just doesn't have good optics for you. Let's go to an 1828 Webster's Dictionary and compare today's definition with one from back then. Oh God, really? Seriously? Can you just get to the fucking bones already? What relevance does an almost 200-year-old dictionary have to how we use language today? Sure, they appeal to God in the 1828 definition, just like they appealed to scriptures in their definition of truth. But again, the appeal to God is not in the definition itself, it is used as an example. But seriously, the word science has changed its meaning over the last 400 to 500 years. It used to essentially refer to what we today would call common knowledge. And here, you are appealing to a definition of the word science that predates the invention of the word scientist by six years. In a general sense, knowledge or certain knowledge, the comprehension or understanding of truth or facts by the mind, the science of God must be perfect. You know what? This definition is actually kind of like a transitional form between the common knowledge definition of the 1600s and the knowledge obtained through the scientific method definition of today. By that definition, you could still interpret it to mean common knowledge, but it's getting closer to appealing to our process of understanding the world. It's not quite there, but it's getting there. So this is an excellent example of language evolution in action. They look pretty similar with one tiny exception. Did you catch the reference to God? Of course I caught that, but leaving God out of the examples of usage section doesn't make it similar to our modern definition. The older definition allows more wiggle room for what could potentially be considered scientific knowledge than the modern definition does. And please notice that it's a capital G God, not the lowercase g. It doesn't matter either way. You can appeal to an outdated definition all you want, but oh, is that why you prefer the fidelity to an original definition of truth? So you can appeal to an older definition of science and call it more true than the modern definition by virtue of the fact that it is older and therefore closer to how it would have originally been defined and therefore is more true? That's sneaky of you. Why does that matter? Simple. Let's take a look at how various textbooks define how science works. Is this whole video really just going to be a definition fight again? Three videos into your series on fossils, and you're still not talking about fossils. What does it mean to say that an approach is scientific? The goal of science is to investigate and understand the natural world, to explain events in the natural world, and to use those explanations to make useful predictions. Science deals only with the natural world. Science is an organized way of using evidence to learn about the natural world. Yes. Now, I notice you keep emphasizing the word natural. Well, here's the thing about that. In our study of how the universe works, humans have often proposed supernatural explanations for things that they didn't understand. Lightning, wind, storms, reproduction, floods, even something as clearly human as war. Now, over the course of time, as our knowledge increased, natural explanations kept replacing the supernatural explanations. Never once has a supernatural explanation replaced a natural one. The supernatural, by its very nature, is not a scientific idea. Hell, you love appealing to dictionaries to make your point, so let's look up supernatural. Of or relating to an order of existence beyond the visible, observable universe, especially of or relating to god or a god, demigod, spirit, or devil. In other words, something that cannot be experimented on using the scientific method. Ergo, whether you believe in the supernatural or not, it is not a part of the scientific body of knowledge by definition. Did you notice something new has been added? Let's look at another textbook. 
The goal of science is to explain natural phenomena. Scientists ask questions about natural events and then work to answer those questions through experiments and examination. Scientists who expect that nature is predictable, which means that the future behavior of natural forces can be anticipated. Yep. The supernatural, historically speaking, has always been invoked as an explanation for events that people couldn't figure out how to explain and therefore couldn't reliably predict. This could also help explain why a lot of gods historically had something to do with one of the things that humans have always had difficulty predicting, even today, the weather. Storm gods, sea gods, lightning gods, wind gods, even fertility gods often doubled as gods of the harvest, the quality of a harvest being largely impacted by the weather of that particular season. Here's one more. In science, explanations must be based on naturally occurring phenomena. Natural causes are, in principle, reproducible and therefore can be checked independently by others. If explanations are based upon purported forces that are outside of nature, scientists have no way of either confirming or disproving those explanations. Exactly. If something is the result of a supernatural power like a god, then that thing is based on that god's particular whims. Test the thing a second time and the god might not feel like performing in the same way. So if I hypothetically grant the existence of supernatural forces, they still don't fall into the purview of science because of their untestable and non-reproducible qualities. Where did all this natural events, natural causes, and natural whatever come from? It comes from the fact that a study of nature has greatly advanced our knowledge and technological abilities, while the study of the supernatural has often held us back with barbaric practices like sacrifices, or with denying demonstrable natural phenomena because of some perceived conflict with the supernatural beliefs. Come back and ask this question again after a study of the supernatural has yielded some useful result. That's not in either the 1828 Merriam-Webster Dictionary or the modern-day Merriam-Webster Medical Dictionary definitions. It is implied in the modern one by its appeal to the scientific method. No, it's been added for one simple reason, and that's to try and remove a supernatural force. And that supernatural force is God. Okay, now using the scientific method, please demonstrate the existence of your proposed supernatural force. What test could be performed whose results would falsify the God hypothesis? The ability to falsify an hypothesis is one of the foundations of science. So before you can start talking about the supernatural being scientific, you have to first figure out how we would go about falsifying the supernatural. The bottom line is that the word science comes from a Latin verb which means to know. Yes, that is where it originally came from, etymologically speaking. But we aren't speaking Latin now, are we? We're speaking English, specifically 21st century American English. Well, I'm speaking the Canadian version, but it's similar enough to American English as to not really warrant a distinction, at least verbally. We still spell things differently. So an appeal to what the word meant in a dead language that our language happens to have borrowed a number of its words from is rather useless. But yeah, truth is the fidelity to the original, and in the original Latin, scientia meant knowledge. Therefore, the word science isn't true unless it just means knowledge, ignoring the scientific method part of the definition. So science is simply a way of knowing. But how is that knowledge obtained? Through the scientific method. Notice the dictionary definition addresses that question. It tells us that knowledge gained through the scientific method. Yep. Now kindly provide the framework of a scientific experiment that could be used to verify the supernatural. Every time it has been done, the supernatural has failed to hold up to scrutiny. So let's define the scientific method, and we'll do that by going back to the dictionary. Oh, holy fucking shitballs. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I really thought he would actually get to talking about fossils in this one. I didn't realize it was going to be another definition fight. Principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. Yes, and here it bears mentioning that Merriam-Webster is not a technical scientific dictionary. This is just giving the general idea of what is meant by the term scientific method for a layperson. So while this definition is not incorrect, it also doesn't properly flesh it out. Maybe go for an encyclopedia entry for this one instead. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, it goes to the trouble of explaining how you form an hypothesis, design a test, perform that test, observe the results, refine your hypothesis based on the observations, repeat the test with the refined hypothesis if there were unexpected results, publish your results, have your test replicated and repeated by other scientists, and only then is the hypothesis considered to be accepted scientifically, and now new tests can be done based on that hypothesis. Come up with something like that to test the supernatural and then get back to us. To keep it simple, the scientific method consists of a series of seven steps. Those steps? 
observation, question, hypothesis, prediction, and experiment. Now, if the experiment doesn't support the hypothesis, revise it. Come up with a new one. If it does support it, make additional predictions and test those. Oh, good. So you do understand how it works. So has any of this been done for supernatural claims? Well, to quote Jonathan Fishman of the Department of Neurology at Albert Einstein College, naturalism is not a premise or presupposition of science, it is a conclusion of science, albeit a tentative one, based upon the available evidence to date. He went on to say that the best explanation for why there has been so far no convincing independently verifiable evidence for supernatural phenomena, despite honest and methodologically sound attempts to verify them, is that these phenomena probably do not exist. Indeed, as discussed earlier, absence of evidence, where such evidence is expected to be found Found after extensive searching, is evidence of absence. This paper was largely concerned with the Kitzmiller v. Dover decision to ban the teaching of intelligent design in the classroom, so they were specifically referring to creationist claims that can be tested. So while I agree with this paper for the most part, and really all the important parts in the creation versus evolution debate, I would disagree that all supernatural claims are testable. The very existence of a god itself is not a testable claim. Though, as I have pointed out in other videos, the more specific you get with the claim, the more testable it becomes. Which is why, while I would find myself as an agnostic atheist, an atheist who does not assert that there is no god, but rather I am unconvinced of the claim that there is a god, I have no trouble making the positive assertion that the Christian god, as described in the Bible, does not exist. There are too many internal inconsistencies for such a god to be real, but I'm not going to get into the details here because I'm still holding out hope that we're going to start talking about fossils any minute now. Let me give you a practical application to this process. A while back I was speaking in Missouri. I set my computer projector up, I plugged them into the same electrical outlet, and tested everything. It worked great. About an hour later, after the worship was all done, I got up to speak, and while the projector was working, my computer wasn't. So you prayed to God and it immediately started working again? And then you were able to duplicate this experiment and have other people duplicate it with consistent results? Observation. Number one, the projector was working. Number two, the computer was not working. Number three, they were both plugged in to the same outlet. So here was my question. One, what in the world is going on? Assuming from context here that your computer is a laptop, my first guess would be that it either was not plugged in on the laptop end or that your power cable was faulty and so the battery died. But there are a myriad of other issues that you could have had and without actually seeing this happen, I can't really be sure of my diagnosis. I'm very uncomfortable standing in front of people without my computer. Number two, what did I do to be put into this position? Number three, where's my mommy? And this is an application of the scientific method how? My hypothesis, I had options. Number one, my computer's fried. Number two, there's no electricity. Number three, God is punishing me. Number four, it was the power cable. Number five, the display settings were incorrect. Number six, the power button was worn out. Number seven, the RAM failed. Number eight, the hard drive failed. I could go on. My prediction, depending on the chosen option, one, have a heart attack, go to the hospital so I don't have to stand up here without my computer. A proper application of the scientific method here would be to look at the possible reasons for failure and try different fixes one at a time. If one doesn't work, move on to the next one. I don't think having a heart attack will ever fix a computer. Number two, plug into a different outlet, see if it works. That's actually a valid option. Sure, it was plugged into the same outlet as the projector, but it is possible for one outlet to fail and the other to continue working. Rare, but possible. It's also possible that depending on the model, the projector might have had a battery backup that was fully charged, while your laptop may not have been fully charged. So if the whole outlet failed, that would account for that. Number three, reprint and pray that God will make it work. Sure, I guess that's an option, but in order to test that option, you'd have to be able to repeat the experiment. Here was my experiment, depending on the chosen option. One, I couldn't manifest a heart attack, so I didn't try that. Number two, ran an extension cord and plugged into it. Number three, prayed like crazy. And I'm seeing a potential problem with your experiment design here. If you try multiple fixes at the same time, you have no way of knowing which fix actually worked. That's like rule number one of computer diagnostics. Even if it would be more convenient to do multiple things at the same time, if you want to actually know specifically what went wrong, you only deal with one potential solution at a time, so that way you can figure out which problem you solved. If you've got a paying customer and you figure that you may as well swap the RAM and the hard drive at the same time while the computer's powered off, and it works after you've done so, you've now got a paying customer that is buying new RAM and a new hard drive when they potentially only needed one or the other. 
outcome, depending on the chosen option. One, it didn't happen, thankfully. Two, the computer turned on. Three, it's always a good thing to pray, so I was blessed either way on that one. So you tried two fixes simultaneously, one natural and one supernatural, and you decided that the supernatural one was the one that actually fixed it, even though it could just as easily have been the natural one. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that the natural one is more likely. I have seen way more problems fixed by plugging it into a different outlet than by praying. Yes, that may be a silly example, but the scientific method is based on observational, empirical, measurable evidence that's been gathered and can be tested. And in your example, the supernatural element was not adequately controlled for. You failed to isolate your variables. As such, your experimental design was incredibly poor and would not make it to publication in any reputable journal. Take a look at how one biology textbook puts it. Science requires repeatable observations and testable hypotheses. Yes. So repeat that experiment, only this time don't apply two fixes simultaneously, just choose one or the other. Then do it again, then again, then again. Repeat several more times for each hypothesis without overlapping your hypotheses. I guarantee you that if you can actually reproduce the situation exactly, the natural solution will work significantly more times than the supernatural one. I can't tell you how many times I've seen preachers have technical difficulties, give a quick prayer, and then move on without whatever technology wasn't working because it didn't start to work again after the prayer. But the ones who take a few moments to figure out the natural solution usually could fix it because usually the problems in these situations are fairly simple. One challenge that you will face is those that don't believe in God, they'll say, if you don't believe in evolution, then you shouldn't take medicine, you shouldn't fly in an airplane, or you shouldn't use a computer. I don't usually hear people saying that you shouldn't do those things. It's usually more along the lines of enjoying the irony of a creationist denying a huge chunk of modern science, all the while making use of technologies developed by modern science. And that's because, according to them, belief in evolution is how we were able to create all of those things. No, not really. I mean, there are, of course, several aspects of modern medicine that would not have come about without the study of evolution, but I think we'd probably have figured out computers and planes even if we didn't figure out evolution. But it's really hard to say. So much previous science goes into our understanding of modern technology that I am not willing to state categorically that we would have developed these technologies even if we never understood evolution. Applications of scientific discoveries are often very tangentially related to the original reason for the research. Hell, if you're watching this video on a Wi-Fi connection, then you are using a technology that was originally developed by actress Hedy Lamarr to prevent enemy ships from being able to jam radio-controlled torpedoes. You never can tell where a scientific discovery will be applied in the future, and the roots of any given technology can usually be tracked back to dozens if not hundreds of individual discoveries that probably had nothing to do with the modern use of that technology. That's simply not true. Using the scientific method, which came from Bible-believing Christians, is how man was able to create those as well as many other amazing advances in technology. Yes, Bible-believing Christians developed the scientific method, but they developed it in spite of their religion, not because of it. Quran-believing Muslims developed algebra and the decimal system, but I'd be willing to bet that you do not accept Islam because of the important mathematical principles developed by the Islamic mathematicians. Why then should I accept Christianity on the grounds that the people who developed what we now recognize as a scientific method happen to be Christian? I mean, Darwin was a Christian when he developed his theory of evolution, so by that logic, you should accept evolution. It's almost like whatever religion someone holds to is completely irrelevant when discussing discoveries that have nothing to do with religion. Now, I have to admit that if there were only PCs and no Macs, well, evolution may have had a chance. I'm honestly trying to figure out that joke. Like, are you saying that Macs show clear evidence of design and so are being pro-Mac? Or are you saying that PCs are easier for the end user to upgrade, allowing your computer to gradually evolve into a better computer over time. Either way, this doesn't really follow. Also, PC Master Race. But I'm not joking when I say that science is incapable of proving that something doesn't exist. Well, that depends on the claim. You certainly can prove a negative in mathematics. And in the case of the God claim, as stated earlier, if you make claims about the properties that your God has, then the non-existence of your God can be demonstrated based on the testing of these properties. So, for instance, when the Bible says that God is love, but then lists several things which God hates, and several items on the list of things that God hates are things that he himself has done, then that means that the living embodiment of love must hate itself. This is self-contradictory, and so such a god cannot logically exist.
Science can prove that there, there is an existence of certain things, but it cannot prove that they don't exist. In some instances, yes, but not always. If I tell you that there is a dragon in my garage, then you can prove that there is not a dragon in my garage by going to my garage and looking in it. The problem comes when an observation that would falsify the claim is rationalized away after the fact. So you go to my garage, look in, and don't see a dragon. Well, of course you don't see a dragon. I forgot to mention it's invisible. Okay, but I just walked through your entire garage without bumping into anything invisible. Well, obviously it's intangible, too. No matter what test you throw at my garage, Dragon, I can come up with a reason why that test didn't falsify its existence. Same is true of God claims. The Bible says that people with faith as small as a mustard seed will be able to move mountains, and nothing will be impossible for them. Yet we see people with apparently much more faith than just a mustard seed's worth, and the laws of physics still seem to apply to them. The book of Mark literally states that those who believe will be able to cast out demons, drink poison without harm, and heal the sick with the laying on of hands. Yet we see people who are prayed over with the laying on of hands get sick and die just like everybody else. When I was a Christian, there was a wonderful South African woman who was a member of our congregation. She had cancer. We prayed for her with the laying on of hands and the anointing of oil on a regular basis, but she still died of cancer. These are supposed to be the signs that God uses to show people who the believers are, but they don't ever appear to work any better than the placebo effect. But the faithful will just explain these away. Obviously, nobody in the congregation that prayed for the lady had pure enough faith. The moving of mountains part is a metaphor, or barring that, it's an example of how we flawed humans can't even muster enough faith to be compared to a mustard seed. When the faithful get sick and die just like everybody else, there must have been something wrong with their spiritual lives, or God is using them to bless someone else somehow, maybe through their example of how they retained their faith in adversity. That's the problem with the God claim. No matter the outcome, it can be attributed to God. We prayed and she still died of cancer? It was part of God's plan. We don't know what good will come from her death, but surely God will use it for a greater good. But had her cancer gone into remission, as cancer is known to do sometimes, then praise God, he healed her. If every answer points to God, then the God claim is inherently untestable and therefore unscientific. Did you know that the father of the scientific method was Galileo Galilei? Well, Francis Bacon was the first to formalize the scientific method, but he was heavily influenced by the work of Copernicus and Galileo. Galileo is sometimes referred to as the father of physics, though. But hey, let's leave Bacon out of this. Galileo works better for my position. So the guy who is the father of the scientific method, according to you, is the guy who the religious authorities imprisoned for his heretical view that the Earth is not the center of the universe. He is the go-to example of religion holding back scientific advancement, as the church banned his book throughout most of Europe. Who knows what discoveries he might have made had he not been censored and imprisoned. Even before he was imprisoned, he spent a significant amount of time defending himself and his views from the church. It wasn't until 1992 that the church officially admitted that it was a mistake to have punished him for his scientific view of the world. So what were you about to say about him? Interestingly enough, he was an ardent Christian who stood firm on the Word of God. Well, he was a devout Roman Catholic, which oftentimes fundamentalist Christians such as young earth creationists will construe as not being true Christians. But since you're admitting here that he was a true Christian, that strengthens my point about him being persecuted by the Christian authorities for heresy and attempts to reinterpret the Bible. You see, Galileo didn't appear to take the verses about the earth being immovable and on firm foundations, literally, and the church considered that a heresy. So you have a devout Bible-believing Christian presenting scientific evidence that runs counter to the religious ideas of the time, and rather than accept the science, the religious leaders condemn him. This is eerily similar to the situation between young earth creationists and Christian scientists. People like Mary Schweitzer and Francis Collins present evidence for deep time and evolution, and the young earth creationists insist that true Christians take Genesis literally, and so accept a young earth. They just don't take it literally enough to believe in a geocentric model of the universe. Another two scientists that had very big impacts on the scientific method were Sir Francis Bacon and Sir Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, the alchemist who dabbled in the occult. Newton's occult studies were more important to him personally than his scientific work. Given what he did accomplish, just imagine what he might have accomplished had he not been preoccupied with magical thinking. And Francis Bacon, the man who developed the scientific method, who believed firmly in the study of nature, but also believed that God's existence was not a matter for science to address but could only be concluded as the result of philosophical arguments. 
I feel like you didn't do very much digging into these people before you decided to parade them out as perfect examples of science and religion going together. Sir Isaac Newton wrote more on the Bible than he did on science. Yeah, he did. What a waste of talent. Both of these men were ardent Christians. Or did you know that the reason we are doing space exploration today is because of Dr. Werner von Braun? Von Braun? The Nazi party member and member of the SS who used concentration camp slave labor to build the V-2 rockets for Germany during World War II? More people died building those rockets than were killed by those rockets. Now, sure, he wasn't exactly an enthusiastic Nazi, but he's not exactly a shining example of the best humanity has to offer, and I'm sure we would have developed space travel eventually without him. Yeah, he was an evangelical Christian later in life who often spoke of a connection between science and religion, but I'm a bit cynical of his conversion. It happened right around the time that he surrendered to the Americans, a country known for its religious fervor. I try to avoid attributing motives to people when I can't actually know them, but the timing of his conversion is suspicious to say the least. Take a look at what Dr. Von Braun said about the scientific method. Ultimately raises the question of a designer. The scientific method does not allow us to exclude data, which lead to the conclusion that the universe, life, and man are based on design. And while I am tempted to just dismiss this as the words of a literal Nazi, Von Braun was a very intelligent man and did indeed provide many useful advances in the field of rocket science. But again, just because someone is intelligent does not mean that they are immune to magical and religious thinking. To be forced to believe that everything in the universe happened by chance would violate the very objectivity of science itself. Certainly there are those who argue that the universe evolved out of a random process, but what random process could produce the brain of a man or the system of the human eye? So clearly this rocket scientist had a less than perfect understanding of biology. Super smart in one scientific field does not equal expertise in all scientific fields. And evolution is not a random process, it is guided by selection pressures. Anyone who refers to it as purely random is displaying their ignorance on the matter. Please don't be deceived into thinking that just because you don't believe that gas using slow gradual processes over millions of years turned itself into everything that you can see in science and see in the world around us, nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, I think he got distracted in the middle of that sentence and forgot how he started it. I think he was trying to say, don't be deceived into thinking that just because you don't accept that gas turning into stars and fusing into heavier elements, which eventually led to planets, biology, and you, means you are being unscientific. Nothing could be further from the truth. Except, yeah, we have a pretty good understanding of the processes that turned hydrogen and helium gas of the early universe into the stars, and then the other elements, and how planets formed, and how evolution happened. Sure, there are some gaps in our knowledge of these processes, but not knowing every single detail of every single process in the universe does not mean that all the details that we do know are wrong. When you look at the founding fathers of most branches of science today, you're going to find Bible believers. Bible believers who went against the religious consensus, who wasted time and energy in useless pursuits that would have been better spent elsewhere, who believed that science was not how you would demonstrate God's existence, and a literal Nazi. Like, seriously, dude, there were plenty of great scientists to choose from who were Christian, who didn't have famous run-ins with the church, or didn't explicitly state that arguments are the only way to prove God, or who didn't dabble in alchemy and the occult, and who weren't Nazis. Why would you not choose one of them instead? Take dinosaurs, for instance, which we'll talk about in later classes. I thought this was a later class. This is class three of your class entitled, What About Bones? And in three videos, I can count on one hand how many times you actually mention fossils. It is really striking to me that in order to present evidence for evolution, I didn't have to spend three videos, four including the next one which is also not about fossils, just setting the stage. When I did my Evidence for Evolution series, all I had to do was present the evidence. No preamble, just here's the evidence. But in order for you to present evidence against evolution, you first have to spend four videos talking about stuff that is completely irrelevant to the fossil record or evolution. You have spent a good chunk of time setting up your spin of the facts and trying to make it look like it's not spin. Assuming part two of this video also doesn't get into fossils, spoiler, it doesn't, he basically just plays the check this out video on historical versus observational science which I've already responded to, but what I'm getting at is that four out of the nine videos of your series called What About Bones are not even tangentially related to anything to do with bones. 
Hell, video 5 barely even gets into it. All he does in that one is look at an article about Homo erectus brain size and spend the whole time pulling the Mike Riddle fuzzy words maneuver. So that's more than half of your series called What About Bones that has nothing to do with any actual bones. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Adam, who says, I disagree with you when you say there can't be both intermediate and no intermediate fossils. It's completely relevant. Example, Homo erectus is intermediate when looking at Homo sapiens and an older relative, but Homo erectus is not intermediate to anything if it's the reference point. Therefore, any intermediate fossil could be deemed to be not intermediate. I agree with you, but the point that they were making in their video is that a person who says that no intermediates exist at all is technically correct. Because yes, depending on what you're comparing it with, any fossil could be either an intermediate or an endpoint for the comparison, but that does not extend to the statement no intermediate fossils exist. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the fossils that prove the evolution that is my channel. If you'd like to argue over the minutia of definitions of words like truth and science, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Yeah, the beginning of that is supposed to be related to the end, but hey, the video I just responded to is ostensibly about fossils, so I stand by my nonsense. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!